you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so Welcome glad you're to here. episode 32. Now pass me that bottle, please, and now let's I'm get started. change things up a bit with this episode. I've taken the best bits from my Facebook Live video show and included them here for you. We're going to chat about the trend of orange wines. Is orange the new white? We'll also talk about the new meatless burgers from the company called Beyond Meat, which I managed to mangle, or should I say grind, as Beyond Beef and Beyond Burgers, but it's Beyond Meat. I wanted to see which wines paired best with these burgers, veggie burgers, really, and if I could drink the same wines as I would with a real beef burger. Speaking of meat, if you missed last week's episode, number 31, about pairing wine and charcuterie, go back and give it a listen. James Beard award-winning author Jennifer McLagan has some fabulous advice about how to prepare a charcuterie board. That's the selection of cured meats usually served before dinner and how to pair them with wine. Finally, in this episode, I chat about gadgets to keep your wines cool at the cottage or in the backyard. Now, this was a lot easier to do on live video as I was posting the links to these items so that viewers could see them. So I've included all of the links to the gadgets in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 32 for you. I also asked the Facebook video viewers to post questions and comments in Facebook. And I'd ask you to do the same, whether it's in the show notes blog post for this episode or just email me directly at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. If you're listening to this episode live on the day that it's published, on Wednesday, July 10th, please join me for my Facebook Live video show at 7 p.m. Eastern this evening at nataliemcclain.com forward slash Facebook. We'll chat about a whole new slate of topics, including the challenge of how to pair wine with seafood, the real dangers of flying champagne corks if you don't open your bottle of bubbly properly, I'll show you how, and how one cork stopped the men's match at Wimbledon this past Friday, and finally, the new trend of sober curious wine drinkers, as reported in the New York Times recently. I'll also announce the three winners of Karen McNeil's signed book, The Wine Bible, Yes, we always have prizes. We're live every second Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, so after July 10th, it'll be July 24th, and so on. Please say hi in the comments on Facebook if you join me. I'd love to know that you're there and that you heard about the show through this podcast. If you can't join me live or you're not on Facebook, you can always watch previous episodes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash videos. I'll include all of these links to the show notes as well at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 32. Enjoy. So we're talking about some really fascinating topics like orange wines and wine pairings for meatless burgers. They're so on trend now. And even how to keep your wine cool at the cottage. So lots of interesting things. And as always, if you want to take your wine and food pairing to the next level, join me in a free online video wine class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash class. Okay. So we're going to start with orange wines, very meaty topic, whereas our meatless burgers are not meaty, but that's where we're going to start. And then we'll go on to meatless burgers and wine pairings, and then how to keep wine cool outdoors. There's some really innovative products these days and just some practical tips, homemade tips that you can use to keep your wine cool if you're at the cottage or on the deck or just outside in the backyard with a barbecue and so on, because warm, flabby wine is just no fun. Okay. Let's dive into orange wine. So 
there may be many of you saying, oh my gosh, what is an orange wine? Well, let's clarify first off that it's not wine made from oranges. It does have an orange hue though, and that has to do with the way it's made. Orange wine is also known as skin fermented white wine or amber wine. Again, the hue and color. Orange wine is very trendy. Chatelaine Magazine interviewed me a couple weeks ago. The article just came out. Chatelaine, for those of you who are not in Canada, is our largest sort of lifestyle magazine aimed at women. They do a great job of a lot of in-depth reporting and very serious issues, but also they do a lot of lifestyle. It was interesting that they were talking about this because it is kind of trendy, but it's actually a very ancient style of wine. It goes back maybe 8,000 years ago to Georgia. That would be the country, not the state, where the wine was made in quiveri. I think I'm saying that correctly. Clay vessels like amphorae that kept the wine cool. Often they were buried too in the ground for more cooling so that as the wine fermented, it didn't get ruined. It's only been in the last 40 or 50 years that we've had stainless steel tanks that preserve or control temperature. Before then, they had to rely on natural and passive conditions, thus cellars that worked underground caves. The reemergence of orange wine started, we believe, in the 1990s with the Italian winemaker Josco Gravner in the northern cool region of Italy called Friuli. He was trying to get away from over-manipulated wines, back to natural methods. We see this in the food world as well. Going natural, organic, biodynamic, less or no additives, just food and drink as the way nature intended it. And of course, orange wines are kind of on the rise along with natural wines. That's a whole other topic that we can deal with. They're not necessarily the same, but they can be. Today, orange wines are produced in Europe, North America, Australia, Chile, South Africa, New Zealand. Get this, Ontario is the first wine region to legislate how orange wine is made through the Vintners Quality Alliance, the VQA. Provincial law went into effect in July 1st in 2017. Niagara Southbrook Vineyards was the first to request this category from the VQA in March 2016, as the winery was already making orange wine from skin-fermented Vito grapes planted in Four Mile Creek Vineyard. However, it did not fit VQA categories, and it had to be labeled as a product of Canada. So very broad, not reaching the VQA standards at that time. They created the new category, and they had to be specific about their vineyard and geography, often the sign of a good wine. It also puts these wines into a more favorable tax category, which is interesting, about 35% more revenue that rewards artisanal and local products. Orange wines are white wines that are made like red wines. Are you confused yet? (laughs) They start out making a white wine. That's what they do. Their intention first is white wine, but then they leave the grape skins on during fermentation, just as red wines do and white wines do not. This imparts a distinctive color, flavor, and texture, whereas the skins are removed to ferment white wine. Orange wine also has more exposure to oxygen, which adds a savory character called umami. So that's the fifth taste, along with sweet, salty, bitter, and sour umami, often described as deliciousness. You get it in Parmesan cheese and cooked mushrooms and so on. Now, a few things more. The VQA specifies that the wine is table wine. It's made from fresh white or pink vinifera or permitted hybrid grapes. All the grapes are macerated and fermented on their skins for 10 days to achieve the color of orange, 10 days. The words skin fermented white have to be on the label. Optionally, orange or amber can be there. Here's an interesting thing. Vintners must also declare their intent to make a skin fermented white wine at the time of harvest, just as they do with ice wine. You can't say after you finish picking, oh, this is going to be an ice wine. You have to declare at harvest what your intention is so that they don't claim the label after the fact because the wine didn't get approval for another category. So it has to be very intentional. The skins of the grapes contain 
aromatic precursors, which is so interesting. I know it sounds technical jargony, but there's things in the grape skins that are aromatic precursors. So they come before those aromatic compounds come into existence. They're like triggers. And the compounds eventually get released into the wine and create its distinctive aromas and flavors, as well as the polyphenols that shield the wine from oxidation. Now, there's two arguments on orange wine. Some criticize orange wine as masking local soil and climate, terroir is the technical term, as well as grape character. They think because of this process, the skin's left on to ferment, the kind of character it gets, the Earl Grey tea or the cidery, beer-ish kind of character, they think it's masking. The opposite camp says orange wine is truer to terroir, the soil and the local climate, because it uses all of the grape, flesh, juice, and skin. So everything is in there. Like natural, organic, and biodynamic wines, orange wines usually don't have any additives, nor are they filtered or fined. However, not all natural, organic, and biodynamic wines are orange, and not all orange wines are natural, biodynamic, or organic. They can be. There's a little Venset intersection there, but they're not necessarily the same things. So who makes orange wines in Ontario? Pearl Morissette, Southbrook, we've heard Vinland Estate, Vineland Estate, which I haven't tried. You won't find an orange wine category list on most restaurant wine lists. They're usually lumped in with the white wine category, sometimes rosé, except, of course, on the very hippest restaurant lists in San Francisco, New York, Paris, Tokyo, Florence, and perhaps Toronto. Usually, you'll have to look more carefully to find them. They don't usually separate them out. That is my treatise on orange wines. What do you think? Are you curious to try them for those of you who have not? So I was up at the cottage in Quebec yesterday. We came home today. I had a meatless burger. I've had them before. Beyond Beef, I think it's called. On the Globe and Mail, which is, I think, the best Canadian newspaper, they did an analysis last weekend of all the meatless burgers that we have available to us. So President's Choice has one, Maple Leaf Foods has one, but they all, I thought, got dissed except for Beyond Beef. And I must say the Beyond Beef burger is the closest thing I've tasted to hamburgers. I love hamburgers. I love meat. I'm a carnivore. I'm an omnivore. I eat everything. I drink everything. But the challenge, of course, is not just taste, but texture, right? And you know what? I'm going to post that article. It's probably behind a paywall on the Globe and Mail, but I'll post it anyway just in case you want to check it out or you have a subscription. It's pretty good. Basically, they really liked Beyond Burger or Beyond Meat. The valuation for Beyond Beef has gone up sixfold since May. We went public as an IPO on the stock market in May. It's the largest IPO so far this year. So it's beating out all the tech companies that went live. There's a bunch of them. I don't know, was it Uber and Lyft and everything else? So why not just stick with beef? I do think that there are some significant benefits with reducing cholesterol through a plant-based burger. I'm not exactly sure. I think there's pea proteins. There might be soya. It's a mix. I'm trying to reduce my red meat. Throughout the week, I mostly eat chicken. But on the weekends, I like to have a steak or something, whether we're going out or we're just barbecuing. But this Meatless burger gives me an alternative because overall I do want to reduce red meat. Me personally, this is not dietary or nutritional or health advice, but just what I've read about the heart benefits, the cholesterol benefits, and so on um, of more of a plant-based diet. And now that they're getting in sync with taste and texture, I'm on board. So when I tried it, I thought, hmm, because it's plant-based, I'm going to have to have like what I would with veggies, like white wines or something, rosé, to be thorough for you. I tried both white wines, like a Zippy Riesling, a Sauvignon Blanc, and then I tried heavy reds. I found both worked. Maybe mentally, I'm just thinking burger and the red worked, but it certainly didn't overwhelm the flavors of the meatless burger. I found it was just very versatile. 
and it worked with both light whites and heavy reds. I was just excited to find it. So that's my prognosis, but I would love to hear what you think. And if you try the meatless burger wine pairings. Okay, I'm going to post some links about cooling products. So first of all, when you're dining al fresco outside, especially in the summer, some of the basics are to keep your wine out of the direct sunlight, because that's going to heat it up. So if you can have it in the shade or even in a cooler, including your white wine, especially if it's a super hot day, you want the refreshment. You want red wines served at a slightly lower temperature than they normally would be. So you could have a cooler or an ice bucket. Ice water is the fastest way to cool a wine, including if you put a bottle in ice water, even in the winter time you're inside, versus the fridge, it's going to chill down quicker in ice water. And it's even going to chill down quicker in ice water than just ice, like a bucket with just ice. And I think it's the dispersion, the water around the bottle. I'm no physicist, but I read this over and over again that is going to have a greater, faster chilling effect. That's just the basics of chilling wine. The other thing you can do if you're at the cottage, of course, if the lake is usually pretty chilly, put the bottles in the lake. That can work. But let me show you some products. I have not tried all of these products and I'm not necessarily endorsing them, but they just look pretty cool to me. So one of the first things I'm going to share with you is these glasses that sort of have a cold exterior and you put your wine inside. I have not tried these and I'm interested in trying these. Let's try the next one, which is a sleeve for your bottle, I believe. Kind of the similar concept, but for the bottle rather than the glass. Then we've got cooling pouring spouts. So the wine is cooled as it's poured. This is a fast chiller cooler. It apparently takes your adult beverages and cools them very quickly. The corksicle, it's a cool icy thing that will help chill your wine. And then we've got reusable ice cubes. So if you don't want your wine to be diluted, I did put ice cubes in my wine yesterday at the cottage and it stretched the batch, so to speak. It slowed down my alcohol intake, which is great because, you know, when you're out in the boat on the afternoon and you just want a slow sip, it's so nice. But if you don't want to dilute down your wine, and impact the taste. If you are going to do ice cubes, make sure the water is good because obviously if it's got heavy chemicals or minerals or whatever in the water, it's going to show through as the ice cube melts. But there are ice cubes out there that you can put in the glass that don't melt. They're rubber, but there's no BPA, that bad chemical. So those are all my tips for keeping your wine cool at the cottage or outside. If you've got more tips, or more gadgets and interesting things you've tried, please post it. But I'm going to wrap up, guys. Do get on my newsletter list if you're not, so you'll know when the next Facebook Live is, when the next podcast is, and all that. The newsletter's free. Bye for now. This was so much fun. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the best bits of the live Facebook video show. If you did, please tell a friend about it, especially someone who's interested in learning more about orange wines, meatless burger pairings, or keeping their wines cool. My podcast is easy to find. Just search for it on Google, Unreserved Wine Talk, or on my name. You can tag me on Twitter or Facebook at Natalie McLean, and on Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. As I mentioned in the intro, if you're listening to this podcast on the day it's published, July 10th, please join me at 7 p.m. Eastern this evening at nataliemclean.com forward slash Facebook. If you can't make it, the next one will be July 24th and then every second Wednesday after that. I'll include this link and all of the other ones I mentioned, including the orange wines I recommended in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 32. Now, next week on the podcast, we'll be chatting with Mary Ewing Mulligan, master of wine and author of the best-selling wine book ever, Wine for Dummies. You're going to learn about her fascinating journey into the world of wine, as well as her best wine tips. 
Finally, if you want to take your wine and food pairing to the next level, join me in a free online video wine class at nataliemcleancom forward slash class. I can't wait to share more personal wine stories with you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this one. I hope something great is in your glass this week. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcleancom forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.